Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining the National Civic League for our February webinar, Reflecting Racial Equity in City Policies. My name is Rebecca Trout and I am the Program Director of the All America City Awards here at the National Civic League. For those of you less familiar with the League, we are a 125 year old nonprofit and we aim to advance civic engagement to create more equitable and thriving communities. The All America City Awards is our flagship program. It began in 1949 to recognize exceptional examples of civic engagement in local communities. We use that war award to really lift up and celebrate to communities who are doing great work. And then we use this webinar series to highlight their best practices, as well as resources, tools, and speakers that we think might help you with your engagement efforts. Before we dive in to today's webinar, I just wanted to give a quick plug for our award this year. Um, this year's All America City Award is being held in collaboration with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. And as such, our, our theme for this year is housing as a platform to promote early school success and equitable learning recovery. Um, we have seven different focus areas under the theme this year that you could submit an application under. Those applications are coming up due soon on March 1st. We are giving out um, a one week extension to those who request one. So feel free to email me if you are still interested in applying. I will also be sending a follow up email and there will be a link to additional information about this year's award if you're interested. Um, but for today, I'm thrilled that we are going to be focusing on how to reflect racial equity into city policies. We are joined by three exceptional speakers. Uh, first up, we will be hearing from Deanna Shanami with the International Municipal Lawyers Association. Next up, we will hear from Jonathan Butler from the city of San Antonio, followed by Val Nazarbeck from the city of Wheat Ridge. But before I hand you off to their capable hands, a few housekeeping items. We are asking that everyone remain muted to cut down on background noise. We will of course welcome your questions, but we're gonna hold off on those until the very end. If you think of something, feel free to put it in the chat and I'll make sure that it gets addressed at the end. We'll also be utilizing the raise hand feature on Zoom at the end as well. We are recording. The recording and any slides you see will be emailed to you afterwards. And before I hand you off to our speakers, I would like to introduce the newest staff member of the National Civic League. Um, Candace Williams is our new program director of equity and inclusion, and she's going to say a little bit of, about the National Civic League's upcoming equity work. Candace, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rebecca. So as Rebecca said, my name is Candace Williams and I've recently joined the National Civic League as the Program Director for Equity and Inclusion. All of my previous work has been about increasing opportunities for dialogue and engagement in communities as a means of developing community capacity for reflection and sustained engagement. This work is necessary to work on equity and inclusion where difference and sometimes conflict are inevitable. With support from the Kellogg Foundation, I'm excited to continue this work with the National Civic League, particularly as we move forward with initiatives that focus on health equity, youth, and civic engagement. I'm also excited about the larger community I've become a part of since joining the League and look forward to engaging and learning more from our presenters here today and with many of our webinar guests who also support this work. Um, so I will turn it back over to Rebecca, who will turn it over to our amazing presenters. Thank you so much, Candace. We're so excited to have you on board. And now I'm going to have Deanna kick us off. Deanna, the floor is yours if you'd like to start sharing your screen. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Deanna Shanami. Um, and as Rebecca had mentioned, that I'm the Associate Counsel at the International Municipal Lawyers Association. Depending on the generation, we're called IMLA or IMLA. Um, and I would like to start by thanking Rebecca and Candace and the National Civic League uh, for asking me to speak to you all um, and tell you what we've been doing at IMLA as in regards to DEI. Oh, lastly. Okay, so this is us. Um, as she explained, the slides will be sent to you um, so that you'll be able to read this really quickly. Now. I specifically lead our DEI working group, and I have since January of 2021. So just the year before, as everyone knows, 
uh, that the country was dealing with COVID, uh, loss of employment, loss of life, homes, and of course, the murders of, just to name a few, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Aubrey. So I knew what I was taking on would not be an easy task. See, I myself am born diverse. I'm a child of immigrants, one from Cuba and the other one from Iran. And I feel as though my own experiences, cultures, and educations have given me a unique perspective on how to receive DEI-related resources, what to look for, how to process them, and also to know how to discuss them while keeping an open mind in the process throughout. Because I know I can only speak to my own experiences to a certain extent, but all other issues, I have really encouraged a lot of our members to come in and to talk um, firsthand um, about a lot of different things, which I'll get into. And diversity has taken on such a broad application. And in that time period, of course, has allowed many individuals to give it a negative connotation. Um, and for those who doubt diversity itself, I said in our first meeting to remember that specifically we'll talk more, you know, especially about employees, but that employees are investments. And the number one rule for an investment portfolio is to diversify. <laughs> and to explain specifically what our working group is, like all of our other working groups, it's free for our members. So any member who would like to join our diversity listserv uh, can, and it's basically a gateway to our materials, resources, and meetings. So it's kind of nice to be, a, it's different to be a speaker because I'm used to being in Rebecca's position hosting. Um, but for our first meeting, I laid out the goals and I tried to make it as basic and general as possible. And right here, they are on the slide. And the first one is to discuss issues on diversity and equity in local government from office environments to local policies. The second one being develop ways to prioritize inclusive services to underserved and underrepresented members of the community. The third, find ways to expand an understanding of the unique perspective of these constituencies. And the fourth, to provide resources to our members on matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I say them specifically because DEI is also one concept, but we forget at times that those are three individual terms that have different meanings, meanings, excuse me, and that it's very vital to have resources in each so that our counties and cities that depend on us as members have access to those. Now, how have I done it? Well, I've done it in a bunch of ways. I basically took the ground running because that's just how I am. And Candace reminded me I have a type A personality. So here we go. This is what it looks like. The first one is Zoom meetings. I talk to members and that's what I mentioned before. I can't speak on every issue. And so it is vital to talk to people of the community in local government who can speak to those issues and experiences. And a lot of these meetings have almost turned into therapy sessions because it's very important to make sure that we are talking about these issues, that 2020 doesn't go in vain, that we remind ourselves that this is something that has always occurred historically and in present time and what that looks like now and how we can change it. And a lot of people enjoy that type of conversation. They like to talk about it rather than just read an article about it. It makes people more engaged. Um, also, another way of engagement is book club. I'm very proud of this book club because one, I didn't realize I could do that in a work like environment. And a lot of the books I definitely pick. I mean, it is what it is. Um, and they're all about local government. And a lot of them are race related because to, and, and very historically based because to understand our history is to understand our law. Um, it's all intertwined. Our culture, our law, the history, it all comes together. And that is what creates and helps us understand not only how to interpret law, but how to apply it and how we can use it for our clients and for our cities and counties alike. And of course, that with that said, I mean, it goes to say, well, the, oh, well, that's the law or that's how things are. We know now that those do not apply. And in law school, a law pr uh, professor said that we protect as attorneys the system because the law can change and we have seen it change. And so, as attorneys, we have that obligation to protect the system. So, um, and one of those things as well within the law is creating laws. 
that protect historically marginalized groups. Because as we know, through our amendment, through constitution and, and you know, state laws, is that the laws were not written for everyone and how we can create laws that are inclusive and um, that are a reflection of our states and communities alike. And we have webinars. I'm in charge of the distance um, learning program. Uh, so I've made a very intentional effort to create diversity and bias webinars. Um, also because CLEs, it's great that a lot of bar associations have required a diversity and bias. Um, unfortunately, the two states that I'm licensed to practice, Illinois and Florida, like I wish that they didn't have CLE, but a credit, you know, um, but at the same time, it's it's a great, great thing that a lot of them are at, at least having this as a requirement. And that's something that I've tried very hard to provide. Articles is a great resource. Uh, resource library is great that we've constantly updated. Um, awareness celebration months, people don't realize that how important that is to be seen, to be recognized. This is a great way that I've extracted so many of our members because local government looks like a bunch of white men. And the awareness and celebration months is a reminder that diversity is, is not just race, it's not just ethnic background, it's also disability, it's also sexual orientation, the LGBTQIA, it's indigenous communities. And these are ways that we can show how diverse our own membership is and give them that recognition and celebrate them for their success that they may not otherwise get either the way that they've been in their legal career or even sometimes in their office, which I have been personally told by some individuals. And a lot of that is through nomination. You know, I'm not trying to like call people out, but a lot of the times with their permission, it's through nominations. And we've gotten great feedback on that as well. So we have to remind ourselves that diversity is new to local government. So across the US and Canada, because that's what makes us international, um, many local governments have already made a commitment to advance diversity, equity, and or inclusion. So this will be, this could be in like the brainstorming stage, forming advisory groups or gathering data or in the advanced phases of implementing and reviewing DEI departments, programs, and policies. Uh, now, regardless what stage your local government is in, DEI is implicated virtually every time your department or municipality makes, for example, I'll list a few, an employment decision, solicit services, enter a contract, establish a policy, adopt a budget, pass a regulation, bylaw, or ordinance, invokes code or law enforcement, and much more. And with that said, the municipal attorney is present every time there's a decision made. And so that plays, that gives us a playing role, a significant role, of course, in making DEI an integral part of these processes. Now note that the diversity and equity offices and departments are new, as I mentioned, and that we need to recognize that there is a gap between local government and our and the community. And we've noticed as well that DEI related action has slowly bridged that gap. And what does that look like? I threw in some examples, example of a DEI initiative, which GARE is phenomenal. Um, it's a toolkit that was, as I've seen as early as 2015. Um, another example of a DEI commission is from Middletown, Connecticut, and they have an LGBTQIA plus commission, which is now in the city's code of ordinances after Middletown's first Pride Month parade in 2019, uh, which was worked on by Middletown's first ever LGBTQ plus advisory committee. And this showed the importance of inclusion and visibility, which was essential. Um, and a, one other, another thing is a DEI position. Director and Chief Equity Officer. In Baltimore, it was, I put 2021, mm. it's 2020 that she was um, nominated in December though. Um, but we're starting to see these types of positions. It could be Chief Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Officer. Like these are all new. A lot of this is new. Um, and one example of a DEI law was the Crown Act in Colorado. Um, the Crown Act is actually um, up and coming in a lot of states and or local governments. And this one specifically amended the Colorado's Anti-Discrimination Act by defining race to include hair texture, hair type, or a protective hairstyle that is common or historically associated with race. And this went into effect September 14, 2020. So none of this that it's too late or, you know, maybe we could think about this later. This is something that 
of course, is at the forefront of a lot of local governments. So where to begin? Um, it's you. It, it's you, you know, um, it's and when the first and also like as a leader, as I had mentioned, you know, of local government providing legal advice, it's important to identify and acknowledge your own assumptions, prejudices, biases and beliefs. Um, which can play an important role in how local government represents clients, interpret law, retain employees, and maintain relations with the communities they serve. Now, when observing your office and municipality, identifying and understanding DI in its current status will help you plan on how diversity, equity, and inclusion may be advanced. So, for example, like in your office, you can look at data collection in the form of a written feedback, but you know, there's a lot of exit interviews, um, track professional development opportunities and reach out to minority law school uh, associations for internships and mentorships. Don't spread yourself thin because sometimes it could be one person who's already an attorney and they're like, hey, can you just do this DEI initiative or start this? Um, it may not be an entire department. And I would say, just do what you need to create a sustainable policy and practice. Like, do not rush this. You're not doing yourself or the community a favor. So what to consider? I've listed out in a cute PowerPoint way. Um, the six things that I have listed, of course, you know, this, it could be different for everybody. Um, this is not, you know, exact or it could be different yeah for for your office as well so don't take this too directly so for one it's important that your office and leadership prioritize and demonstrate a strong commitment of diversity equity inclusion and in the way that i've seen it it's a dei mission um, or value statement on the city or county's website visibly and vocally support the dei initiatives and enhanced career development for diverse attorneys and leadership positions. We understand that a lot of local government positions is word of mouth. And I did mention that a lot of local government looks like white men. So word of mouth, if you look at your top five friends or your top eight in my space, I mean, it's not, you have to really think of, do they look like me? How diverse is your close network? And also what is that doing if one person keeps word of mouth for the next position. That is not as indicative with the type of goals that we're trying to do on a diverse level. I mean, it may, some people really have a lot of different friends, but that's not, the, that's not as common as a, we would like in local government and have seen. And communicate and collaborate your collective vision for a DEI initiative. You can do it to the HR, the mayor, and agencies committed to providing opportunities for innovation, jobs, resources, and data collected or consistent with your commitment. You have to be intentional. You have to create sustainable goals and guidelines that are consistent with your mission for each initiative and include the local government's commitment, the initiative's purpose and procedures on accountability for leadership and employment. You can't just throw out a policy and not understand how it's gonna be practiced. And, um, and that's what a lot of municipalities are trying to look at nowadays is just how can we keep this going? And how can we keep the people that are, we are hiring to do this type of work, how can we keep them accountable to make sure that they are actually doing the work? And another is to hire a full-time DEI professional to facilitate or implement, um, implement um, your local government's initiative. Um, if the budget allows. Now, the number one thing a lot of people say is, well, we may not have the money for it. Okay, we can also admit that we've seen money just magically created, but I won't go there. The reality is we are in an equity state. We are at an elevation point of time. Segregation costs a lot of money. Integration costs money and elevation will cost money. And it's all about prioritizing. And so the whole money thing, it's very hard for me to accept. Um, I think it's all about prioritizing. Um, and again, I had mentioned, what does it do? What are the benefits? You're, you're trying to bridge the gap between you and the people that you represent. That is vital. That's vital. And what you're setting the tone in your office and the workforce, because not every employee, municipal employee is in the office. 
is setting that type of precedent early on. Another is recruit, retain, and advance diverse attorneys. Hiring um, and interview panels, like if your department's large enough, and other leadership positions. So if your uh, municipality has multiple departments, it's important to tailor efforts of improved retention and, inclu and inclusion to each department. And another is provide on-site DEI education and training for the office or require attendance to DEI conferences and seminars for leadership and or employees. And this is a great way to show every employee, this is what we are, this is our mission, and this is what we need you to do and understand as well. And so there are some municipalities that have come up in our meetings and says, yeah, the, the mayor has required every single municipal employee to take this training. Um, and I think it's great. I think it's great. And so you can sometimes find a third party that's willing to provide that type of training or a video or something of the like that they can lean on and educate themselves with. So I talked about the book club that I'm very proud of. And these are some of the, at the first one, the Netflix documentary, clearly it's not a book. Um, but it is, in fact, a material that I think is very important. Um, and I have other books here that are listed that um, have been very instrumental in a lot of the involvement of our members as well. Um, so just for your for your leisure, you can always, and of course with that, let me know what you think. So please feel free to contact me. Um, also, we of course, I'm going to throw on the plug that we would love to have you as a member and to come and join diversity and, and really be part of that um, movement that we're trying to reach all counties and cities of all levels to make sure that this is doesn't that that bus doesn't stop right here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dan. I appreciate um, those words. We did have a couple of questions come in for you. To, for you through the chat, um, and we'll get those answered at the end. Um, I think a lot of people were interested in your book club list and resource library. So thank you for including the book list on your slides. Um, now I am happy to be able to turn it over to Jonathan Butler, who's the Chief Equity Officer for the City of San Antonio, a multi-time All-America City Award winner. Jonathan? Well, thank you for Becca and thank you all for having me. Um, I have to say this, whenever I present, I think about the fact of the times that we live in right now. And in two years of pandemic, I have welcomed literally thousands of people into my home office slash living room slash kitchen, as you can see behind me. And so I just want to give you all a welcome from the lands of hundreds of uh, first people um, known as the Tapilum, the uh, Dokam, um, the um, Kauhawitekin, and um, this is the land of San Antonio, Texas. Um, you all have the privilege of, of witnessing my last sort of address as a member of our team from our equity office. Um, as of um, Monday, I will start a new uh, job for the Tulsa Authority for Economic Opportunity um, as the Senior Vice President of Community Development there. And so I'm still going to be doing racial equity work. Um, I'm just going to be taking it to the context of neighborhood revitalization a little bit more directly um, and affordable housing and equitable development and economic mobility. Um, so it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I am going to moderate my remarks some, and I also just got a notification from my apartment complex that a fire alarm may go off. So if it goes off, Val, and you hear that, then that's your cue. It's, 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 it's your time to, to go ahead. Um, and then I just want to be sensitive to time because I know you all will have a lot of questions and I want to make sure that I get through it. Um, just briefly, our origin story here in San Antonio, um, we really are an office that was created based in community and by community um, through the passage of a non-discrimination ordinance in 2013 that expanded for the purposes of city government, really what we talk about and consider as protected classes. Um, Deanna and I, as, as attorneys and, and me having that hat that I 
wear and put on and off in, in multiple settings. Um, very much familiar with this idea of what legal protections people may have, but us as a city, we thought it necessary to make sure that we expand it to particularly include um, gender identity, gender expression, um, we did include veteran status. Um, we um, talked more broadly about disability to encompass more than just physical um, abilities. Um, and from that, we got an office that was initially a diversity and inclusion office that was really formed in 2015. We moved with connections to the Government Alliance on Race and Equity to focus a little bit more on racial equity um, and formally recognized as an Office of Equity in 2017. And then in 2019, we really um, built out the lion's share of the operations that I want to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, we finally staffed up in ways that were necessary um, if you're thinking about forming these offices and you're trying to build these offices, they do require resources, they do require staffing, they do require investment. Um, it is not significant enough, in my opinion, to simply have a chief equity or diversity officer or something in the diaspora of diversity, equity, and inclusion without thinking about how you're going to equip them with people to be able to attempt to move the work in your organization. So I think that that's extremely important as you think about um, what you may need within your respective institutions. We centered our philosophy building on Gare's model of the idea of normalizing, organizing, and operationalizing around equity work. When I break that down, if we think about normalizing for us, we think about ways in which we build capacity and we think about ways in which we build a shared understanding, shared languages. I did not introduce myself using my uh, pronouns he and him earlier today, but that concept and that philosophy is something that we are attempting to ingrain within all of the machinations of city government and our workforce to ensure that certain behaviors now become normalized. And so we built out a training component associated with it. We have an equity training program where we have trained about 100 of our coworkers to then be equity champions within their departments. They also go out and deliver equity training, um, a content-based curriculum that we have designed in three parts. Um, right now, we are in the second seasons of those departments really delivering what we call our Equity 101 training, which is advancing equity in local government. We have a second part where we talk about centering um, and we think about really the foundations and the roots of institutional and structural racism. And then our third part, we talk in detail about how do you operationalize this work within your various departments. That's our normalizing bucket. We think about it as capacity building. In the organizing bucket, we put our people um, thinking about how can we organize teams of people to be able to go out and be change agents, but also how can they transform policies, procedures within their workforces and within the delivery of services to then be much more effective with reaching equitable outcomes. Organizing, we created a citywide equity committee that is made up of at least one person from each department. They serve as almost our policy think tank to make sure that when we think about things such as dress code policies, such as language, such as restrooms, such as um, community and public engagement, that we are able to look at these things across all of the sectors, connect the dots that make sense and inform what we have in the city of San Antonio as administrative directives that actually are our top level policies, guidelines, procedures for all of our workforce. So our citywide equity committee helps us do that. Um, um, Erica, in our chat, we were talking about our budget equity tool, where our citywide equity committee helps us build out what we do within our budget equity tool and how we engage departments 
They are our frontline people to be able to work with us, to work with departments in accounting for ways in which they actually budget for equity. I'll get to that in a minute when I get into the operationalized budget. We also organize people within their own um, departments creating equity action teams. So we have a process in which we do department equity assessments, in two years, we have done about 15 of 40 departments. We're working on our current set of five where we do deep level equity analysis. We do these assessments within the departments, not only the department and the delivery of their services and programs, but also their workforce. Um, the idea then is to create two year equity action plans that are the blueprints for how folks are actually using and working and operationalizing equity in what they do. Um, those equity teams are significant component to what we do within those departments. When I talk about organ operationalizing, then I talk about the tools. I talk about our budget equity tool. Every department is responsible for submitting and responding to questions within the budgeting process that detail and account for how they, in fact, are allocating resources towards more equitable outcomes. The allocations of resources could be staffing. It could be devoting staff to those training programs that we have designed, participation. It's everything that they do, though. And the analysis is then, well, if I take, for example, in the affordable housing context, something that's near and dear to me and one of the departments that I liaise with, we are literally tracking how programs, service delivery, product, benefit, and burden certain populations. And so when we think about the diaspora of affordable housing, we're also thinking about, well, how are outcomes improved for lower income persons in our community and marginalized communities of color? So we are taking a deep dive of looking at those things within our tools. Budget equity tool is one. Um, we designed tools to um, incorporate equity into the distribution of COVID um, recovery funds um, and ARPA dollars. We have done the same in creating equity matrix and scoring criteria for proposed bond projects, transportation development projects, um, for economic development projects. Um, and so we've got a lot of tools in our toolbox. We have an equity atlas. Um, that is on our website. I think I dropped the link to our website. You can take a look at all of these accesses to these tools within um, our website. But we have an equity acts atlas that overlays a couple of things. It looks at the traditional redlining policies of the 1930s and 40s. And it tracks where people are, where highest concentrations of people of color are and highest concentrations of income segregation. You can use that tool interactively to figure out where things happen then in our communities. This tool is highly effective for our departments to say, hey, these are ways in which we can think about where need is, we can identify need, and we can target resources and interventions in that way. The last thing I'll highlight in terms of tools is we have a racial equity indicator report. Um, which significantly emphasizes all of the gaps and all of the disparities in our communities. We are a city of about 1.5 to 1.6 million people in San Antonio. We are one of the highest cities in the country um, in income segregation. We are the seventh largest city in the country, the second largest in the state of Texas, and we still have significant disparities that are largely based on all of the institutional practices of, um, you know, decades and centuries ago. The last thing I just want to say as I kind of, you know, wind down and leave some space for Val and then leave some space for questions is this. We believe as public servants, we have the obligation and the ability to directly impact and improve the outcomes of significantly of the most marginalized members of our community. I'm not gonna do my whole equity training talk with you all today, but in thinking about this idea of equity and if we center needs, and I'm not gonna do the contrast between racial equity and equity, we can have that conversation at some point um, later. But if we focus our problem solving based on needs, we center people in decision-making, and we include them in processes to be collaborative, 
actors and problem solvers with us. Those results are not only going to improve the communities that have the most significant challenges, that benefit is going to be for all of us in our community. We as public service servants are most qualified to be able to enact those interventions in part because government has had a history in ensuring inequitable outcomes through direct policies and laws as Deanna talked about earlier um, and practices that really contributed to negative outcomes for people. So that's my spiel. I'll hand it over to Rebecca or Candace and Val. You can go ahead. I'm glad we didn't have a fire alarm um, interrupt um, my talk and look forward to the Q&A. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Really appreciate um, the point about making sure that this isn't siloed work and that it's really throughout every city department. I think that's a uh, point well taken. I would let, now like to uh, hand things off to Val Nazarbeck with the city of Wheat Ridge. Had the great pleasure of getting to know Val and the city of Wheat Ridge during last year's All America City Award project uh, process and they um, featured their equity work as part of that application. So excited for her to be able to share some of that work. Val? Thanks so much, Rebecca. And thanks, Deanna and Jonathan for everything that you've shared. And Candace, it's great to be a part of this with all of you today. Um, I um, wanna just share um, where my community's at um, on this work right now. Um, I, I'm coming to you in this space, um, really not saying that we've figured it out <laughs> and that we've got it, we've got it, um, I, we've got the solution for you. Um, but what I am here to share is um, how hard this work is. And if you're ready to step into this space, it is going to be probably one of the most challenging um, things you'll ever do in your leadership role, whether you're a staff member or you're an elected, I'm an elected um, coming to you today in that space. Um, but it is also the most opportunity to have such ripple effects of impact. Um, if you're willing to just take off the, you know, kind of armor that we have around these issues and really step into this space. Um, and so I, I, I don't want anybody to, I guess, you know, quote me and say, well, we tried to do it in our community this way, Val. What, what I'm asking for everyone is to take this um, experience I'm sharing and, and see where there are opportunities to apply it um, in your community. Um, so much of uh, what uh, was the catalyst to Wheat Ridge taking action um, was uh, the murder of George Floyd. Um, uh, our community came together and um, was, was, was showing up um, on a daily basis um, and then on a weekly basis. And uh, the community that was showing up, they were showing up in a park, they were um, making sure that um, they were uh, amplifying that Black Lives Matter and we were trying to figure out what the path forward was and how we could fix things at, at, in our community. Um, the organizers uh, of that de those demonstrations um, decided to form a group called Wheat Ridge for Equity. And I, as a city council member was attending, um, but then we started to, to think through um, how we could make an impact. And one of the pieces that I think is foundational to the work that we've done is our community had laid the infrastructure with some, uh, we had a, a, a program called Wheaties Academy, or it's kind of a civic leadership 101 program. And um, a lot of the people who were part of the, the Wheat Ridge for Equity group had also participated in understanding how policy was made and how you impact um, you know, ordinances and things in government. 
And so um, I had recently been elected to city council um, and was also a part of the Sweet Ridge for Equity group. And we started to think through um, what, where is the systemic racism in our community? And to just be really blunt with all of you, we were a lot of white people looking at each other saying, what, what is this? Like, what is this? And then we, then we remembered back to what we had learned in our, um, our civic leadership training. Um, Wheat Ridge was um, incorporated as a city to avoid busing um, in Denver. And so there is a very systemic reason why a bunch of white people were out protesting and demonstrating because we were not in a space that was um, created for people that weren't white people. <laughs> and so that was the, um, the piece that we had to realize but we were ready to take the next step. And I do wanna share a little bit of my um, history in this as well. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that I, I really stepped into this space is my family was one of the founding families of, of this community. My family has been in Wheat Ridge and settled here in 1880. They settled on um, land that for centuries, <laughs> for a century, they considered their theirs and their own. And um, only in recent, recent times with a lot of work that I've been doing with my family, have we researched and discovered that this wasn't theirs. There was someone, there were um, families here before them. Um, the, the Ute um, tribes were here in Wheat Ridge prior to, to my family um, being here. But what, um, why I'm sharing all of this is that um, there's a lot of discovery um, when you start to look at how this systemic racism um, has become a part of a community and their origin story. Um, and uh, in my case, my family was one of the families that, you know, was in leadership positions when they were um, incorporating as their own uh, city to stay out of that charter. So, or to stay out of being incorporated into Denver and part of the busing. So lots of internal work going on for me as a person, as an individual, but also I'm taking that into my leadership role on council as we're figuring out what the next steps are going to be. So um, what we figured out was that we needed to find a way that Wheat Ridge for Equity would be a organization that could be activists, that could call out um, why people call Wheat Ridge, White Ridge. And um, then figure out who our allies were on council, one of them being me, to help push through not just a resolution that said, you know, we condemn racism, but actually make sure that that resolution had some teeth to it so that we could start doing the work that, you know, like Jonathan said, I, I, my, my experience prior to running for office was working at state agencies. So I understand how the, the staffing bureaucracy of um, these, these spaces work. And, um, and so we decided to put together a resolution that yes, condemned racism and you know, set the, the playing field that we were not going to accept that this is, you know, who we were, who we were going to be as a community moving forward. But that we were also going to, um, we're going to put together a task force. Um, and we were going to, my, my council is all white. Um, we do have um, a predominantly, I think we're all, we're majority women um, now on our council, which is good but um, that's still not the diversity that we're looking for. And so we decided that with this resolution, we would um, put together a task force. So like what Jonathan was saying, um, we would have problem solvers 
<laughs> and people coming to the table who had the experiences that people on council or also amongst our staff might not have that perspective as either either. And so we put together a task force um, that is now looking at that original charter that, um, I mean, this is not fun work. This is like, this is hard, not headline grabbing, not anything that people really want to do on a Wednesday night, you know, like just go sift through line by line. Um, but sifting through that original, <laughs> I like that, Jonathan, a lot of heart work. <laughs> um, but sift through that charter and figure out where um, our guiding values that were put together in the 60s in Wheat Ridge no longer align because we have a lot of work to do. I mean, I loved what you were talking about, Jonathan, about a, you know, like looking at our budget from the lens of how this impacts our, our, our equity work. Um, and we are just in those very early stages. We also, um, in this resolution and the guidance that we gave to staff, um, worked with um, bringing in, and we did a public implicit bias training because we are not in Wheat Ridge trying to educate, you know, the communities of color or those that are, you know, underrepresented from different socioeconomic backgrounds. We are not trying to educate them on the issue. We are trying to educate the people who don't think we have an equity issue. And so we've made our implicit bias training um, something that is available online. I think I shared with Rebecca our equity task force, um, Wheat Ridge Together page. Anyone can step into that space and take the same training. Council did that publicly and we asked some really tough questions. It wasn't pretty. And um, so we're just kind of walking the walk, right? Um, in this space um, and, and trying to find ways for people to, um, to um, see themselves as part of the problem but how can they be part of the solution and where do they, where are they ready to engage? Um, and so we're trying to give some of those tools. Staff also did quite a bit of, um, it's all on this page, but you can see some of the, the um, things that we did with um, the Wheat Ridge Police Department. We um, did implicit bias training with our community advisory group that meets regularly. We've, we've done a lot of those um, kind of things, but I think, you know, I, nothing, <laughs> we're not where Jonathan is and what Jonathan was describing there, but we're, I think, laying the foundation for that. Um, I wanna leave some time for questions. So I'm gonna kind of buzz through um, some of the other talking points that I had here. Uh, the, um, some of the major accomplishments that we've had um, Jefferson County, which is the county that Wheat Ridge resides in, has used our task force um, as a kind of guiding light <laughs> to put together um, an inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility task force at the county level. So for us, that means that we're going to start looking at housing um, and some of those programs through this lens as well. Um, and we're working with them with our task force to make sure we're aligned. Um, our boards and commissions, um, we, we did some adjustments to make it so that if you sit on a board and commission, you can um, have access to our rec centers and some of the child care services that are provided at our rec centers so that you're not just doing this type of boards and commissions work for free. And then, um, you know, selfishly, not in time for my term, but for anyone who is elected to office, we've now doubled the salary for people who serve on council. Um, and so that's making it a little more accessible for people to consider running for office or serving on boards and commissions. Um, I, I would say that biggest lessons learned are that this work's not done. Those are accomplishments. Um, biggest lesson is that as an elected, a lot of times staff wants to um, just get the job done. And, and I mean this with so much 
love and admir ad admiration for our staff, but they do want to check a box and just say, this is good to go. And it's, it's really important to keep pushing forward that um, this is not something that we can say, okay, we did our implicit bias training, we're done. It's that we have to keep going and what's the next step. Um, and uh, I think I'm gonna stop now, but I'd love to, I'd love to talk to anybody and everybody about more. Um, I'll share my contact information <laughs> with you. Thank you so much for your time. And I, I realize it's a little rambly, so sorry. I just love to share. <laughs> And thank you all for being in this in this work and this space with um, all of us today. Thank you so much, Val. Really appreciate um, the genuine and vulnerable nature of your remarks. Um, love the perspective of having a community that is more on the front side of this work in juxtaposition to the work of Jonathan in San Antonio. Um, I think that it can be really daunting and it's nice to see a community who just started and is figuring it out along the way. So thank you for sharing your story. Um, I do want to have a few um, moments for questions. I see Marcus Harris has uh, raised his hand. So I'm going to ask you to unmute and um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marcus Harris, Diversity and Economic Opportunity Manager for the city of Sandusky, Ohio, nestled on the shores of Lake Erie um, here in Ohio. Uh, my question is one about resilience most likely. Uh, my position was created in uh, September of 2021. And as we have gone through and started to announce our, our strategic plan um, actions uh, going into this year, and we are kind of moving forward with that, there was some beginning to be pushback from the community and the terms critical race theory and Marxist ideology was thrown around uh, towards uh, my work and, and, and personal attacks and a whole Facebook group was created to get me fired. Um, how do you, uh, stay resilient through uh, these types of, of, of jars and, and, and stabs and pokes towards you uh, in doing the work. Can I start? Please. I don't know who that was for, but I'll just go ahead and jump in. Um, well, I will say, Marcus, thank you for that really good question, because I feel like we talk a lot about what we're doing, but also your question really addresses how we feel and how we, do we keep that momentum. And the number one thing I found in my own work is if you're having the support of your office, which is key into any type of job that you do or the people that surround you on a daily basis, but know that you do have more support than you do have people that speak against it. Because when you don't like something, you're going to speak against it more than just sitting back and nodding like, no, he's, he's right. He's right. You know, more people are vocal, especially those um, that are anti any type of progress. Um, it's, it's a lot of education. It's a lack of understanding um, and a lot like the, the position in which some people are coming from that as long as I, I don't know, for me personally, it's, I kind of tune people out, but I haven't had anyone come at me yet so, or have a Facebook page. So I do, I, I'm so sorry for that. But I will say that we can't let personally what other people say against the work affect us. I mean, I do say that it's always good to consider what other people are saying because they, it might be a good challenge to, and, and it gives you a good opportunity to argue, not to that person, but your point in general, and it makes you more, um, it puts your feet more into the ground, but that in the end, this is what's necessary. I mean, that's that's how I personally feel if anyone wants to jump in. I'll just say this, Marcus, and, and I think I will try to address Elizabeth's question in the chat too, and at the same time. One of the things that we have found most productive in the work is centering data. The best equitable outcomes are data driven. We have significant data that suggest where the interventions are necessary. Though that data, tends to fall heavily on racial lines. So when you talk about all of the other intersections between gender or gender identity or sexual orientation, they are exacerbated based on race. So if you find ways to ensure that you get data, good sound data that supports decision-making, 
then let that be the guide. And that's your lead. You don't ever have to talk about racial equity as a term if the data says this is where the most infections, for example, at the beginning of the, the pandemic were happening. This is where the data is pointing. Let the data help drive your decision making and it will help you deal with some of the anti-Black racism, some of the critiques on all types of theories and critical race theory. And then the other thing is, listen, just the, the effects of history and the acknowledgement of it. We shouldn't be afraid to continue to lean into the idea that this is just history. We're just telling the story of history. Um, and so, but lead with data is my, my suggestion. And I would just say, I'll be very brief, but um, the history is so such the right way to go at this. I had a conversation with a um, someone who was very opposed to the resolution that we put forward. And they said, well, are you saying that we're all racist? And I said, well, I said, and let's get away from these big words and concepts. And I said, I need to explain to you that in deeds that are written from 1987, it says that only Caucasians can live in this neighborhood. And you have to, one of the, the things that I mentioned here in the chat was just, don't waste your time on the people who are just screaming at you because they're into screaming because that's the world, the space we live in right now. But use your time. If you have someone who asks that question and they're gonna give you the space to respond, really give them a history lesson. You're exactly right, Jonathan. Thank you so much for those remarks. Um, I had a question come in about uh, someone who is revising their city charter. And I just wanted to mention and lift up that the National Civic League yet recently underwent a revision of our model city charter document. And it now includes, it includes explicitly civic engagement as well as equity components. Um, and that is available um, on our website. I'll include it in the follow-up uh, to this webinar. So if you're looking to update your city charter, so explicitly about equity, then I really encourage you to take a look at that. We're also available to offer any support with charter revisions. Um, so I, we are running short on time. I realize we didn't have a ton of time for questions. I wanna give our speakers a final last parting thought, if you will. Jonathan, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. I just wanna say this, look, this work is everybody's job. It's not just Marcus's job because he has the title or Candace's job because they have a title. This is everybody's job. If we're going to improve outcomes for everybody in our community, then it starts with thinking about how we can do better uh, by the people who are experiencing the most challenges. That's just my sense. So equity is everybody's job. Thanks. Deanna, anything you wanna share before we depart? Oh, I'm just going to piggyback that equity and also education um, that you can give people all the numbers in the world, but we've also seen that with all the facts, people still will not believe what they see. And that is where education and understanding and an open mind to receive that education is vital. So where numbers are not being heard, because I personally believe my numbers talk, let the voice of this is exactly the way that things are and why we are here now, why this data came up about, because data collection is not very easy for everybody as well, but to still provide that, that space um, that, that I think is very valuable. And, and thank you all so much for coming here and to hear about this, you have to come from a space as well of open and understand, like open understanding. So that's why I really appreciate those who are coming or interested to hear us talk about this. Thank you. Thank you. Val, any parting words? Um, I would just say um, to, to folks who are in a you know, leadership role on council, um, really find ways to navigate um, and work with community members um, and get creative. Um, this is not the time to be prescriptive. It's kind of back to what I said at the beginning. Do not do what's been done before because what has been done before got us into this mess. And so um, my, my 
biggest advice out there is that nobody has all the answers. Stay nimble and stay ready and be open. Thank you so much for that. All right, with that, um, we are unfortunately out of time. I feel like we could have had 30 more minutes at least of discussion and questions. Um, however, this will not be the last time that a, a webinar features um, equity. In fact, next month, Candace is going to be putting together a health equity webinar for us. So I encourage you to join us for that. We also have a webinar series every month um, on topics such as these. So I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter to stay in the loop about all of those. I really just want to take one more moment to thank Deanna, Jonathan, and Val for taking their time and expertise. You all did a wonderful job and we really appreciate your time on today's webinar as well as the work that you're doing in your respective communities and workplaces. Thank you to everyone who attended today and um, I will be in touch with the recording slides and any additional resources that were mentioned. Goodbye everybody. <laughs>